May the force be with you is a phrase used to wish a person well to overcome a challenge. The invitation in this podcast, May the Life Force Be With You, is to explore what it means to truly feel alive, to appreciate the physical, emotional and spiritual connection to our energy, and finally to understand how this impacts who you are and all that you do. May this conversation inspire you to thrive. This episode of May the Life Force Be With You is brought to you by Moment Company and The Moment Pebble. The Moment Pebble is a beautiful, natural stone, light-guided breathing device and is a unique gift for someone who needs that gentle reminder to stop and take a break, to take moments throughout their busy day and to practice mindfulness. Just head over to momentcompany.co, that's momentcompany.co and enter the code LIFEFORCE at checkout to receive an exclusive 10% podcast discount. Hello everybody and welcome to the latest episode of May the Life Force Be With You and Karila and I are joined today by our very special guest David Nichol and David is an author, an astrologer and I can't wait to have a conversation around that but first and foremost he has the most wonderfully creative wife who has written the best introduction we have ever seen in the show So I'm just going to read it um, so that you can get a sense of David and his background. And his wife. (laughs) his wife. There's a sense of humour here. I know there's a sense of humour, giving that bit away. Um, But David has a couple of nicknames as a child that captured his essence. One was Bubble, referring to his deep connection to joy. The other was The Bank, as he was the only six-year-old around that had enough sense to save up money that he could loan it out to his classmates. True to these names, David is still one of the most profoundly joyful people you will ever meet and is still a source of wise counsel and care for all his circle. On the deepest level, he understands that in the darkest place, it's within the darkest places that lie the seeds of our greatest light. His passion is to open channels that allow that light to reach deep into the collective heart of humanity. He has a gift for weaving groups of people together into sublime states of symphonic consciousness for personal and planetary healing. I mean, can't wait to explore that. (laughs) And his absolute favorite pastime is guiding people in experiential astrology processes that awaken their remembrance of their unique role in this cosmic drama. I mean, wow. (laughs) That is... uh, Pure magic every time, which is how your your wife finished off that introduction. So, hi, David. Hey, Fiona. Lovely <laughs> to be here with you and Karila, my good friend. So, I'm excited about this conversation. It's funny listening to that intro. I was thinking, <clears throat> I wish I was still the bank. <laughs> I was uh, back then. I somehow had uh had it all together in terms of <laughs> in terms of that aspect but uh it's uh not so easy these days you know what though you're a bank of frequency and knowledge these days that's mm-hmm. what's known out to people <laughs> your your astrological wisdom uh, all <laughs> right give, i'll run with that <laughs> <laughs> you give us wisdom instead and your wisdom is always amazing i love talking to you david mm. i um brimming with where this conversation is going to go very yeah. exciting. well first and foremost i guess we we can dive in with a question that we we ask everyone which is what life force and energy means to you with the background of work that that you do yeah yeah i was thinking about this this morning um you know just on the most basic level right it's like um I feel like life force is when I have energy, right? When I have like a sort of spring in my step. Um, and I feel like for myself, like the, the biggest factor for bringing that is when I integrate more the split off parts of me. Like that's when I notice when I really have authentic energy rather than say when I'm playing a role, <clears throat> uh, so much of our energy, I think, seems to be um, held by those parts that have been buried, right? And and so when I do, when I recover 
one of those parts of myself that have been, um, um, you know, just held down for so long. That seems to be what liberates so much energy for me. Um, so I thought maybe I'd just start there. That's, that's what I'm noticing. I love that stuff. I feel like, you know, cause I, <laughs> I resonate with it. I resonate with it in terms of like when you actually integrate some of your shadow, when you do some healing on, on like a story that's become an archetype uh, or a, a combination of thoughts, words and actions that has become an archetype. When you release that, you get a load of energy. So I totally, yeah. totally resonate. Where I kind of want to go though is you obviously do experiential astrology mm-hmm. which I really want you to explain to Fiona and everybody else yeah <laughs> oh, cool. it's amazing <laughs> and that works with archetypes mm-hmm. and, and I just wonder if when you're doing that are you like I when I've experienced it from you I feel like I get to feel the life force of the planets yeah. Through the archetype. It's like archetype holds life force energy in some way, mm-hmm. whether it's in the shadow, in, in the separated parts of yourself, or as big as the planet. It's like when, you know, yeah, it's like uh, there's something about archetype and life force energy that, that seems to be surfacing in the it's beginning true. of this conversation. Yeah. Well, it's interesting, isn't it? Because <clears throat> I think sometimes we can think of, what's in our shadow is all of the scary stuff or the wounded stuff. Um, But those um, powers that we have are also often in the shadow, like the, the, those archetypal powers. Um, And I think that's, it's, it's true. I think that's, that's what I love about astrology so much is, is um, the, every time, I engage with that world. Um, there's so much fun there, and there's so much. There's so much, like the the gods and the goddesses of that realm. They have all of these powers, uh, and and I'm always energized by that. And and I've only been actually working as an astrologer for the last three or four years um <clears throat> for many years it was more like a hobby that I was doing on the side and one thing that has been fantastic for me about um bringing it more front and center into my work is how energizing it is like when you're doing what you love uh but for me in particular it's it's like I can be feeling really tired I guess I had this call that I was doing with a group and I was actually feeling really quite tired, but then it was like, well, what am I doing? I'm helping to activate the Jupiter power, the Jupiter faith of, of like each of the people who were on the, on the call. And I find that um, inherently, you know, it's, it's, I get access to that energy. Um, so, <clears throat> so yeah, for sure. Can you describe a bit about experiential astrology just so people understand how? Cause I, I well, I was going to say the, the archetypes are probably what everybody just imagines, right? The kind of zodiac signs, symbols, characteristics, and that those archetypes are very much probably what people think there's just those. And then that's, yeah, imagine it to be. Well, well, well. What I love about working with it in this more experiential way is, um, the the normal way of doing astrology. You go to an astrologer, right, and they will say mm-hmm. they will tell you what your chart means. They will tell you what your psyche is like. <clears throat> your sun in Cancer. This means you're blah blah blah. You're a healer. You're this. You're that. Um, and I mean, I like doing that as well, but with the experiential approach, what happens is um, I'll invite you into a um, 
a, a relationship with say the sun in cancer in you. I mean, I don't know <laughs> what you are, but the, I will, um, it's more like just creating a space that allows that part of you to come more to the foreground and, and you start, it starts to speak to you. Like it comes alive in you because they're all right here. We are constituted by these archetypes and, and, um, I just ask the right questions <clears throat> to invite this forward so that then it's you have this immediate direct embodied experience of say that sun in cancer archetype and it's wisdom you know it directly at that point um <clears throat> and um and do you and, think that's yeah. because what you're inviting in is the life force energy of that particular archetype do I think that that's why it works? You mean? Yeah. Or, yeah. Um, I I I think that. I mean, I think that it it works in many ways. For for one, it's like um, these archetypes are us, right? Like we and 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 the beauty of working with it through the astrology is it's not just random archetypes. Like these are the archetypes of your chart. Uh, and so they're familiar. You, you just, I like, I might just help by naming a few of the qualities that help activate that recognition that, oh yeah, right. That part of me. Uh, and then, um, and I think f- for one, there's energy in being more of who we are right rather than the roles we play or the conditioning that 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 we inherited when we discover more of our essence i feel like there's a real connection there to life force and energy like when i'm when i'm more myself when i'm feeling more true to my actual nature and energy i feel more alive right um um would you say that your birth chart astrology map is like a map of your essence then? Yeah, definitely. Mm-hmm. Or like yeah. a, a map of all of the piece, like the ingredients recipe of your specific essence. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so again, that's why I, I, I mean, it's so crazy astrology. Like it, it, it's so it shouldn't work according to our modern worldview, right? Uh, and it so works every time. Uh, and um, and and so, I mean, there's also this aspect with astrology where <clears throat> it's yes, it's more it it activates a quality that you recognize as more you that you re- you just know. Oh yeah, that's that's who I am. That's my unique style or essence or something um and at the same time like right at the same time you're also connecting to being part of the whole right Mm -hmm. so you're you're seeing this is uniquely me and this unique part of me connects me to you know mars or or you know the it connects me to this universal archetype that that is also me so um both of those things feel energizing to me and do you think when you say unique do is there truly um are we all really different I guess is my question when you say that. Are, are we all truly unique? Because you think of the 7 billion people on the planet, um, we, we we cluster ourselves into bar signs, you know, Tureans, yes, I am stubborn, like nice things. You know, there's like this, hey, we all have these characteristics, but everyone has vastly different backgrounds, vastly different cultural impacts and experiences through life. So I'm just playing the, I'm just playing the yeah. devil's good question here. How, how different really are we based on those archetypes? And, and, and is there a common thread that really runs between everybody that you're working with? And 
and we take on the personas because there's something about being comfortable about being put in a bucket with other people. And if it's huh? so when you were born, then great. At least I know that I my trait is the same as somebody else's and I'm not weird because I'm so unique that I'm so different from everybody else. Yeah. So I'm sure there was a question in there, which I think was, how different are we really? Yeah, so different. <laughs> so unique. <laughs> Um, and the, the thing is, you know, we're not just our sun sign. Uh, that's, you know, astrology is very nuanced, right? Yeah. I mean, there's the whole map, uh, and there's, you know, almost infinite number of combinations of there's your sun sign, there's your moon sign, there's your ascendant, there's where all the planets are, how they aspect with each other. And what, what I find is, um, everyone is everyone is themselves, um, but they can enjoy being themselves or not enjoy being themselves. <laughs> like everyone, when I look at their charts, what I tend to find is people generally are you, almost you can't help but be true to the map you've been given, but you can be sort of consciously aligning with that or you can be, unconscious and 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 sort of not enjoying it uh or feeling giving yourself a hard time for why you are this way you can give yourself a hard time for it or you can realize oh uh this is my unique um you know way i'm put together and the unique contribution i have to make and you know get yourself off the hook for uh, see i i would put it the other way to you like <clears throat> most of us have more of that internalized script, which is less uh, attuned to us, right? The, these these scripts that we've got from the culture about what does success mean? You know, what does it mean to be a man or a woman? You know, the, the, what does it mean to be um, an adult? Uh, and, and so those scripts tend to be imposed upon our unique map. And then th this is one of the liberating things I find with astrology is then when you discover, well, uh, you know, I have Mars in Aries, so I will tend to express myself in this particular way. Um, it liberates you from those, from those um, scripts. That makes absolute sense when you say that. And I realized once I'd asked the question, of course, we're all unique. We are, we are, we, we are, our, our thoughts, our, our, our internal belief patterns, the stories that we tell ourselves create that unique kind of element to, to who we are, what we love, what we don't love, who we love, where we are, where we live, all yeah. those kind of things have become part of that map. But I love, I love when you said we, we, we all have that map that we're given and then it's a, a conscious, and sometimes unconscious choice, how we actually then live, how, how we play the cards that were dealt. Exactly. Yeah. I agree. I think one of the most powerful things David ever said to me is like, he was like, you can tell, you know, when you look at like the chart of a famous person, you can tell, you can see that they were going to have like that career or that level Like you can see that like it was in their chart. What you can't ever tell is whether they were going to be good or bad. So, yeah. like, you can see the powers that they had that led to the career, but how they use those powers is kind of up to their free will. Yeah. So, yeah. like, whether they become, like, a messiah or an evil genius, like, you, you can't tell what whether they were going to do good or bad with it. I feel like that's so important because I think a lot of people with astrology think that it's – I know I was put off understanding my chart because I was like, I don't want to be told who I am. Yeah. <laughs> You know, like I want to have the like creative freedom. Yeah, that sense. No, it, I think that's almost like the number one question that that comes up when you're talking about astrology is wh wh where's free will in the picture, uh, mm -hmm. and and the way I understand that is um, we are given these potentials like these that, that are encoded in the chart <clears throat> and um but each of the archetypes has that more exalted expression or or a more or, or a lower expression <clears throat> and and 
how that gets expressed is on us, is how our consciousness engages with that. Uh, and um, so we're not free to have someone else's chart. Like we have the potentials that we have, <clears throat> uh, but within that we get to express the um there's a huge range of expression uh, depending on how we, w- what we bring to it, what, what our, you know, uh, what our conscious choice is around it. So, so does that mean that someone that's destined to be a Taylor Swift can't be a David Beckham? They can only be a variation of a Taylor Swift <laughs> because they're not, they're not, they're, they're, they're destined to be creative, to write songs, to bring music and life yeah. and love to people, but they're not, sports people like that that's not going to be their skill their or is, is that yeah you know, i mean it, 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 <laughs> it, you know it's it's funny when you say that i i did this astrology <laughs> course uh where we were showing um the charts of certain celebrities and we were asked to make certain interpretations um and we were showing david beckham's chart and we didn't know, <laughs> we, we didn't know who it was and he had all this Neptune energy in his chart. So everyone was, was saying, Oh yeah, some kind of spiritual guide, spiritual teacher. <laughs> and then, and then they said, Oh, it's David Becker. So it was like, Oh, it's maybe it's St. David, <laughs> you know? Um, Can I just ask what, what would, so it, just in terms of that, can you once you found out it was David Beckham, did you see where the Neptune energy exists within him and his life path? Did you yeah. find that link? Yes. Yeah. It's see, um astrology is said to be archetypally predictive, not concretely predictive. That's another really important distinction, right? Like um the archetypes can manifest in in so many ways. Uh, but you can still recognize the archetype. Um, like, um, <clears throat> it's not, astrology is not very good for predicting very specific things that are going to happen in the world. Uh, but you can predict the general mood, the general, uh, zeitgeist. That is like bank. Um, th- th- and it's bang on. When you're in your general mood and astrology, it's bang on, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah, and also the cultural zeitgeist. You know that that that's uh, that's where I think it's amazing. You you what, once I started following astrology, um, there's this thing that like developing the archetypal eye. You start to sort of see the archetypes in things uh, and. It is a bit like learning a foreign language, but when that turns on and you start to see the archetypes, uh, then you just, then I would just like follow the headlines and it would be like absolute clockwork. And it has been like this, you know, the last 20 years or so since I've been doing this. It just, you see that the transits change and then the headlines of the news. Mm. They just start mirroring the archetypes that are reflected in those transits uh, over and over and over again. So it's like the the I'm thinking it's almost like there's improvisation. <laughs> it reminds me of drama school insp- improvisation. Like Mars is on the stage and Uranus is on the stage. Now improvise and see what happens. You know, like totally, yeah. <laughs> But yeah. you didn't answer about Dave. So where's the Neptune in David? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to remember specifically what we what we found with that. But I mean, you could say, see, it could manifest like the grace that he has as an athlete, or, mm-hmm. uh, or I think we, uh, you know, I think in his life that the philanthropic element. Yeah, right. exactly. Yeah. Right. Um, or kids, you know, supporting children and being a role model for kids. Right. Things yeah. Are. And, and he, it's quite a dreamy, like. Dreamy. <laughs> I mean, uh, people would say he's dreamy looking, but like he's also, I don't know, him and Posh Spice, 
like her dream was to become as famous as Purcell and like it was her getting with David Beckham that that did do that for her do you see what I mean like there is that living the dream thing living the dream yeah he he has that almost sort of that sort of otherworldly beauty you know uh there's there's elements that you um yeah that that you you see it's I think to answer the question, it's not like I would say, oh, this person is definitely going to be a musician and this person is going to be a sports person. It's more um, that you would see the the um, the flavor of that archetype is going to come through and it could come through in various ways. Um I was going to use the word footprint. It's like there's a different, there's there's a footprint that they're going to leave, but whatever that is, is determined then by choice, by opportunity, you know, and other people around you as well. I would imagine that when you were talking about that, that power, I've got this real kind of sense of that collective energy when you said, you know, news headlines can change and there's this, this wave that influences hundreds of millions of us. So how, how does that impact, how does the, that collective planetary pull or push kind of impact news headlines, political agendas, not just in one person, but but through a whole nation or through, you know, in a case now, Western world, right? Yeah, well, I mean, a, a good example of this is 2020. There was a, a Saturn... Pluto, Jupiter, triple conjunction in 2020. <clears throat> From when I started learning astrology and and the community I was in, we started looking ahead to what transits were coming. <clears throat> it became just this common knowledge in our community. Oh, 2020 is when the shit's going to hit the fan, basically. Uh, and we didn't know precisely how, it could have been a war. It could have been a depression. It could have been, you know, many things. Can you explain the conjunction for anybody that doesn't understand? Yeah, no, absolutely. Like so, and If people don't understand, can you explain why why you thought shit was going to hit the fan? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> because, so, technological terminology. Shit is going to hit the fan. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, um Saturn is the archetype of limitation, of constraint, of it's the reality principle. Um, it's it it can be the principle of problem itself. Um, and Pluto is the principle of total transformation, of bringing it up from the depths, what's hidden, what's out of alignment, and bringing it to the light for for it to be transformed. <clears throat> Whenever those two have been, so in astrology, you, you you look at where the planets are in the sky in relation to each other. If they're from the perspective of the Earth, um, we call a conjunction. They're in the same place in the sky. <clears throat> it's the most powerful configuration. But you also look at things like if they're 180 degrees apart, it's an opposition, or if they're 90 degrees apart, it's a square. And then they activate each other. Those archetypes mm. sort of blend with each other. And um, if you look f- in history, every time Saturn and Pluto come together in one of these powerful aspects, it always coincides with um, a very grave uh, time of crisis. Uh, it's been World War One, start of World War One, the start of World War Two, the start of the Vietnam War. Um, I mean, that is nuts. You know, like, for me, like, astrology is the thing that's, like, poo-pooed as, like, being out there and woo-woo. And yet, like, that is hard and fast evidence Yeah, that these planets and this happen. Like, to me, it's, like, so scientific, actually, astrology, you know? That aspect is where it really poses this huge challenge to that modern sort of um, disenchanted scientific materialism um, because there is empirical evidence. Uh, like you, I mean, the you, start of the First World War, the start yeah. of the Second World War, the start of the pandemic. Like, yeah, how can you not believe that these yeah. things have an influence? 
And with 2020, it, it was, this is the thing, people paying attention, astrologers all around the world were anticipating a crisis in 2020 for a long time. Uh, and, and in 2020, not only did you have Saturn and Pluto, you also had Jupiter. And Jupiter expands whatever it touches. Jupiter makes it big. Uh, so we had the Saturn-Pluto crisis and Jupiter made it global. Uh, and, um, and so, so that's just an example of, um, where, you know, you can track the, um, I mean, beyond 2020, one of the things that I was noticing was then there was this Saturn Uranus thing going on that kind of went on from there. And Uranus is like revolution and Saturn's like law, order and control. And when they were like hustling up against each other after 2020, you were just seeing it in arguments everywhere, you know, right. like some right. people being all about freedom and some people being all about law, order and control. Right. And which was the right way. And it was just so, yeah, it was, uh, and then and then it kind of petered out as that astrological journey of those two petered out. You know, it's amazing when you map it. it it's amazing. It just, it's, it's, you just get really, really confident in it. When you keep, <laughs> when you track it over time, you, you, you just, you stop, it stops becoming a hypothesis and you just start seeing, okay, this is just how it's going to be. Um, and in times like these in particular, I think it's, <clears throat> it's, it's very, it's such a great tool for navigating these kind of times because so much of our sense making in other ways has been breaking down. And so, you know, um, people are trying to understand where are we going? You know, everything's collapsing. Um, and so it's, it's, it's very useful in this sort of moment, I think. So, I, like, this is so fascinating. Um, and I, I, I think about what you said about there being freedom of choice. You know, there's, there's, a, there's a path. There's a, there's a, a map for all of us. Map isn't always the territory. It's, it's just that kind of blueprint that we then can put our own kind of lakes and valleys and mountains in. So, when we look at kind of like things like, you know, pandemic or or wars or perhaps, you know, some some political challenges that we're, we're having around the world now. Two things that came up for me, and that is, if there is a movement of trouble and Saturn's there causing trouble, making it bigger, does the same follow that there's an opportunity to flip it and do a lot of good and magnify and bring a lot of peace and bring a lot of love and bring a lot of a positive back to the world as well and does it mean that there's somebody out there with that map that's got a really strong saturn in them that's just waiting to go i can create that piece is that you know because i I wonder if we're saying someone can create the the bad does it mean that there's an equal opportunity to create the good and we're, we're it's about aligning behind a movement we can all get around because if the stars are the planets are aligned we can we can reverse it we can make a difference Definitely. Um, it's not always bad when Saturn and the three planets get together, is it? Or, or, or <laughs> it's, well, does it the others it's, together? Well, I need to know this is happening. <laughs> this is a good example of, of what I was saying, where like we're, we're free within that archetypal reality to work towards the higher expression of those archetypes mm-hmm. or we unconsciously uh, express the lower. When, like we're not free when there's Saturn Pluto to live out something completely different, a Jupiter oh, Uranus oh. reality, right? right? But but there's always a positive, and there's always a shadow to all of the archetypal complexes. So mm-hmm. so the Saturn Pluto, the positive expression of that is the 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 moral strength of meeting those challenges in a in a brave way in a mature way um um so <clears throat> one image for instance uh, uh 9-11 when that happened that was another saturn pluto time was uh, it <gasps> yeah uh and um the image of 
the firefighters who were running into the building to save the people, mm-hmm. you would say that's a positive expression of Saturn Pluto. Like like that 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 attribute of human that's a noble um expression that you wouldn't get in more carefree times, right? Like that particular um, potential is activated only in those times. So that so, rally around a crisis actually can bring out good, as we know, in people. It can bring out kindness, as we hope we saw in the pandemic as well. Yeah. Like, and you know, Second World War, there was so much charity. I mean, a lot of a lot of good came out of the Second World War. Actually, a lot of socialism and things like that. So, would you say yeah. it's initiated by, like, do these transits like? drop a bomb and then things ripple out way beyond the actual initiation of them? Is that part of it, you would say? Um, I'm not sure I quite... Can you say more about what you mean by that? So, for example, a lot of people would say that, like, the NHS in the UK came from the the Second World War. So so really good socialist things come out of these... You know, in a way, the class system in the UK got completely disrupted by those two wars. So, so the right. system, as yeah. in Saturn, got completely broken open yeah. by those two wars, and then a whole new system is formed. Yeah, because of those kind of explosive right change yeah. moments. Yeah, I mean, the more I feel like we meditate on these 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 realities like these archetypal uh realities <clears throat> the 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 less easy it is to see what's good and bad in a sense like mm-hmm. like in that um <clears throat> from our individual perspective we naturally will gravitate towards or oh, you know am i going to am i going to have a, a lovely Jupiter transit that will give me expansion. You know, are we going to have a, a, a time coming up here where it's conducive to flow and creativity and that's going to be good, whereas this Saturn-Pluto transit is, oh, bad. And <clears throat> and it's completely understandable. And, and at the same time, when you really drill into it, you just see the, the complexity of the universe, right, like the universal mind like as, as you're just saying what, what the profound substantial um reform or development that came out of the second world war um you know who knows like you got to sort of almost put yourself into the mind of god to start to f- feel what's what's good and bad what's meant to happen what's not meant to happen yeah. Can I ask, do you believe that the planets have life force energy? Are they the mind of God? Are they the life force energy of God? What are they? I think that's a really interesting question, yeah. (laughs) Um, Because on the one hand, the way that I've understood astrology is not so much that it's like, Pluto's exerting some force that is causing something to happen here on Earth. <clears throat> it's more like the universe is so interconnected. There, everything is on on so many levels one thing, and the and the and the patterns that exist within my psyche or that exist within a flower like that that these patterns are sort of replicated at all these different levels <clears throat> and and one of those levels is the positions of the planets uh and so because the the that principle of as above so below the microcosm and the macrocosm are a mirror of each other then you can read what what the position of the planets are and that correlates with certain like psychic realities on the earth would you say they're like moving the currents of us like the moon moves the ocean like they're pulling our consciousness currents or their movement affects our movement 
is that like their their life force journey affects our life force journey because we're magnetically connected yeah well this is see i would i'll say my starting point is kind of more what i just said is like there it's more one way i've heard it described is like if you look at a clock <clears throat> the 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 position of the hands of the clock are not causing the time to be what it is. Mm-hmm. Like they're not, it's not causal, it's indicative. Like the the, the, the clock m- mirrors the time or it, it, it indicates, it is, the, the clock is saying it's six o'clock. It's not causing it to be six o'clock. Mm-hmm. So you could say Pluto and Uranus in a position in the sky is, is not causing it to be that way. It's indicating that it is that way. And that it's one of the expressions, you know, it, it, it's, it's a cosmic expression of a reality that is permeating the, the local as well. Uh, <clears throat> having said that, um, <laughs> I, um, I do feel like part of maybe the complexity of life is, I don't know, like I feel this sort of love relationship with the the planets too, and the and the uh, and the like. We talk about these archetypal energies, but they're also gods and goddesses. Mm. You know that that's another way we can relate to them, and that's how the the Greeks did, right? Um, um, and so they can be more more personified, more personal energies. So I don't think that they're just these mechanical objects in the sky that just happen to be reflecting something. I, I, I do relate to them as, um, you know, these numinous forces, but guidance systems almost. Cause I was going to ask you, or I'm, I've been taking some notes. I was going to ask you about half an hour ago, where, where, where it all kind of came from. And it's interesting that you said the Greeks there about the gods and goddesses and how that's represented in the planets. And I'm guessing the Egyptians, even before that, were yeah. very, I mean, when you think about how smart they were, <laughs> for want of a better word, and how connected to the planets they were without all the technology and equipment that we have now, it's quite incredible, isn't it? Is, is that, what? what's yeah. the sort of first source of that, um, of astrology being brought into what we would call myth when we're studying it now, but obviously it's the empirical evidence of how it impacts yeah. what happens on our little planet. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not honestly a, like a scholar of the tradition of the history of, of astrology. I mean, I understand the Babylonians d- developed a lot of it, and then the Greeks developed some from them, and possibly goes back further to you know um these more miss you know atlantis these other civilizations before that uh um but um there's been i think the way i understand it is that they lived in a different consciousness than what we do Mm -hmm. so so in our times, you know, we're so accustomed to living in this separated consciousness, but, you know, they were, they were in a living relationship with the stars and the planets, um, even in a very more practical way, right. In terms of moving around and navigating and, and, um, Uh, and the same with the earth, you know, they were so much more living in a time where they felt themselves to be part of that whole. And I think then they were then more available to receiving the wisdom from, um, from those sources. And, and it, it's still amazing how, how the whole system got put together, but yeah. Yeah. It yeah. Incredible. Interesting to me because you mentioned at the beginning about, how your work gives you energy. Yeah. And as as we're talking, I'm I'm one of the things I've been exploring lately is Eros and how Eros is when your life force energy is moving between sovereignty and oneness. Hmm. Like that's actually it, Eros is that movement and it, it's like there is kind of no 
greater experience of of the movement between sovereignty and oneness than experiential astrology <laughs> you know in a way it's like it's like oh the oneness these planets are moving us oh there's my sovereignty within that it's like yeah i'm seeing that there's this eros element or the dance between sovereignty and oneness i, lo- I love how you put that yeah, yeah like yeah. the, the it, it kind of connects us to the like whole of the you know beyond our atmosphere and then so intimate to our own sense of self and sovereignty. Yeah, I t- no, I, I, exactly. And there's life in it. It's like to me, and I think we we have that intuitively. It's like whenever people are like, you know that that I think we have a special feeling for when something is life giving. Mm-hmm. And we get that when we look at the stars, even when we don't know what stars we look. Everybody gets that, like, oh, the star, you know, like <laughs> yeah. that, that feeling of like being yeah. under the stars, looking at the stars. It, it's because there's this ancient eros wisdom, I think, of mm-hmm. like going big and then coming back to self. Yeah, maybe it's just innate until we became more separated from from that dance. Well, it's interesting because um, prior to bringing astrology more to the foreground, <clears throat> most of my work, I think, as you know, Karela, was focused on what I call subtle activism or collective healing and transformation <clears throat> and creating these spaces where, uh, like, global meditations or big group meditations where the intention was to bring through a kind of healing energy, not just for ourselves, but for the whole. Um, and, um, and that has been my driving force and still is. That's what I feel like is what I'm here to do. Uh, and, but what has been the discovery with astrology that, that work was sort of so focused on the whole and the oneness and the unity uh, and um, bringing it in, in astrology, it's sort of like the discipline par excellence for emphasizing that uniqueness too. Right. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, and, and what I'm finding with it is when you have this dance between um this approach like like there's something i think right at this moment where where this seems to be so much what's being called forth right is the, that that movement into sovereignty and being okay really unique being our unique selves and and um but being our unique selves in relation with each other and creating this this symphony where we can come into that higher unity. Uh, and so um, it's like the astrology has been the missing piece for me in, in the work where um, uh, the, the, the fields that uh, I'm helping to create now, they're so layered with this. Um, it's like, um <clears throat> we're doing this process with with this group I'm working with where all through the process, people are having these experiences of their unique energies, like their unique Jupiter energy, their unique Mars energy, their unique sun energy. But then we're blending that together into this group field, which is a, which is a whole of everyone. Um, And, and the, the, the complexity and the strength that's in those fields when you have um, not just a, a big group of people who are joining together as one, it, it's like all of these unique energies bringing their unique healing powers together. Uh, and, and even when I say that, I feel like, Oh yeah, <laughs> you know, like, that's that's right. That feels like there's a lot of life force in that in that, and it's the same dynamic that you're talking. It's a lot of eros in that, right? Yeah. Uh, 
And so I, I, I have to ask the question because um, this episode will go out around the new year. So I have to ask, what, what what's coming our way in, in 2024 that we can collectively start to meditate on now, that we can create a force yeah. of positive change? What are the what are the, the headlines for the next 12 months? Yeah, uh, well... Tell us good stuff. <laughs> well, it's... What I, I mean, we're, it's such an intense moment. Uh, um, what I will say is something is coming in f- late 2024 through to mid 2026 is uh, um, an incredible shift astrologically. Um, in in twenty late 2024. Um, <clears throat> right now, Pluto is in late Capricorn, and it, in January, it's about to move into Aquarius, and this is a really big deal. Pluto is um, whenever Pluto is the most transformative power of the solar system. So whenever it changes, everything changes, uh, and it will be in Aquarius. F- until September, and then it comes back into Capricorn for one last. Um, I just want to say Capricorn is top-down power, isn't it? So like Pluto and Capricorn is top-down power. Capricorn is like the establishment, yeah. It's like, yeah. yeah, it's like traditional established institutions of power. And Pluto's been in it since 2008, and it, in that time it's been flushing up everything that's out of alignment in the establishment. Uh, think of how um, the views of just generally people's views towards the established power structures now compared with even 2008. Like so much has come up of this. this, this Banking sentence. systems, political systems, everything. Also, yeah. in yourself, top-down power, I feel like we've all had this like journey of like meeting our heads being in control since 2008. And that has also become so like we are learning to not be so top-down power within ourselves as well. Yeah, like being forced to, right? Because No we, choice but to yeah. come out of the head's way of doing things. Yeah. So as early as January next year, we're going to feel a big shift where Pluto moves into Aquarius. And with Pluto and Capricorn, there's much more of a sense of the destruction of the old systems, the established systems. With Pluto and Aquarius, we'll start to feel more of a sense of a pull towards the future systems. Uh, And we're still, though, next year um, in – we're in this incredibly intense moment of transition. And um, so Pluto will go back into Capricorn from September to November. It's like it's it's – Anything that cannot come with us into the new era, it's pushing up to be transmuted. Um, in November, Pluto will move into Aquarius, where it will stay for 20 years. Um, U.S. elections uh, week. <laughs> yeah, it's it's going to be interesting around the elections. Uh, you know that July- there is um, 240 million people will vote next year. It's a third of the world's democracies. Uh, Sorry, 2.4 billion, I should say. A third of the world's democracies all have an election next year. I just got shivers. That's nuts. It's amazing. It's an amazing choice. See, put that in in the context I'm just about to give because um, from November 2024 through July 2025, Pluto... Neptune, Uranus, Saturn, and Jupiter all change signs. Um, And Mm -hmm. as an astrologer, uh, when any one of those planets change signs, because they're slow moving, you feel like, oh, we're in a new chapter. Like everyone can. In a whole new book. (laughs) Yeah. And so I don't know that that has ever happened before where all those planets have changed signs in such a short space of time. Uh, 
So it's it's a revolution, like it's a new world. Um, oh, and four billion is a revolution, isn't it? <laughs> two point four billion people. And so, so humanity is about to make a choice, yeah. you know, as we are uh, poised to enter this new world. <laughs> what kind of world is it going to be? And there um, is the shadow of Aquaria, and there is the like, just like what you've been saying about the personal archetypes. We have a choice of yeah. whether we're going to choose this like community based in circle new earth or technology completely running the show technology running the show sort of group it can be even totalitarian group think mob yeah. rule kind of thing and mentality is the shadow of aquarius isn't it yeah isn't that like group mentality gone like lemmings just following technology running everything like that's the like low version of it and then the high version of it is altruism, compassion, collaboration, connection. It's, connection. It's, it's what we're describing. I think it's this dance of sovereignty oh, and, and and unity. It's 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 all about equality. So it's all about each person <clears throat> being in their uniqueness, but then about the collective intelligence that can come when we join together. So the Eros is actually learning Eros, whether it's through astrology or through listening to Make the Life Force Be With You. <laughs> learning Eros is actually so important for this decision. I think Eros is so key to this whole thing. Yeah. Ah, I'm going to lose myself. <laughs> like, this is so important. You know, like, no, the, the, these is. conversations are so important because. It's decision time. That's what the astrology is saying is like either you know how to be in your sovereignty or you're going to go down down the the path of oneness without sovereignty, which is lemmings. Yeah. And and just to bring in, you know, this is a serious time on the planet, right? And there's um, um, why I do think this conversation is important is, liberating the life force and and having that eros um we need it right we absolutely have to activate that life force to to come into this new era at its highest higher potentials um and i'm quite passionate about this <clears throat> because i feel like the consciousness world has a lot of wisdom it can bring to our collective situation but often tends to uh, limit its potential because i think of a of a limitation on the life force on the eros like like a lot of the consciousness world can tend to be a little bit like heart chakra up uh and it's it doesn't then have the the power to Mm -hmm. meet these Mm -hmm. challenges um and so we need to be like individually and collectively um, activating and integrating that that life force energy, you know, which is also like in the shadow, in the instincts, uh, and 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 then Our together, as well, right? And, and and people having a voice, using your voice, using yeah, your heart. There's lots yeah. of wow. So meeting this, like energetically, how do we meet the the challenges that are arising with an sort of a higher vibration, but one that has the power in it to transmute that? Uh, you know, how do we meet hatred with mm-hmm. power um, <clears throat> or the aggression with strength? And, you know, we have to um, not have the 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 the, the sort of uh, uh, limits that that some spiritual traditions I think have have put on alchemizing those energies. That with we need to do that. That's why I think this conversation is really really powerful. Oh my goodness me! That that I, I yeah I feel that so 
strongly and I know everybody else listening will as well and and as we predicted without the planets we predicted this ourselves <laughs> that our together has absolutely flown by and I feel like we've just kind of touched the surface of the conversation and I I feel like we should revisit when in, there's some significant planetary shifts you can be our regular day you come in and give us some guidance guidance because I'd love to we can talk knowing, for an hour I know yeah. just knowing this I feel like I want to learn more. I want to be more connected. And, and that powerful sense of collect, being able to shift collective energy when we all understand this for ourselves, but also how we can have a ripple impact on those around us, which then just keeps on rippling, right? It's, yeah. That's where good change can happen. So I knew we would get to the end and we'd just be getting started. So we will definitely find a way to to continue this conversation and we will of course share uh, all of your details with our listeners so they can find out um, good sources of information to connect with you as well. Karila over to you for your your closing question. A little bit of a uh, we, we're also um, we'd love to have you as a as, as a workshop we've got a plan <laughs> We'd love to come and we love to back with you. Really We're just dropping that in. Uh, we got a plan. Um, but oh, I've made her. I've made her fro- freeze by saying she wasn't allowed to go off plan. So I will ask. I don't know. Uh, it's my, my closing. My closing question. Although you can ask it if you want. You know, go for it, Karela. It's yours. Who should we speak to next? Hmm. Hmm. Um. Hmm. hmm about life force about anything yeah oh. <laughs> life force and anything are, are kind of the same thing we're learning <laughs> i have a friend who just comes to mind who uh um who i've just met a recent friend um alex olsonski uh he's a he's a he's a guy in his mid-30s who's uh I just really like what he's doing in the world. He's he he wrote a, a really beautiful article for Tablet magazine <clears throat> about what's going on in the Middle East, and mm-hmm. he does a lot of um, um, really cool. He does good men's work, but also addiction work, and he's um, a voice of that generation that oh, I'm paying attention to. Um, um, that's that amazing. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. You. yeah yeah great well i'm 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 reluctant to say thank you very much and that's it <laughs> and that's uh, the end of our conversation today because it has been so interesting mind-blowing <laughs> yeah. yeah and um so, we will definitely ensure that we have your voice on may the life force be with you again a joy to be with you guys it's a pleasure wow I mean, you feel, you can imagine some people at the beginning of that conversation thinking, astrology? Mm -hmm. Really? Being like all sceptical and like, my dad, my dad will be like, oh, what is my daughter doing now? (laughs) And yet, when we got into that conversation around the impact that Saturn, Pluto, Pluto, Saturn, Pluto, and Jupiter all coming together and that alignment, was and also historical seen. timing like when that has happened and what's happened in history like it was just mind-blowing yeah i mean that that like it's like david said like that is evidence that there oh, is yeah, and, evidence. yeah. Oh. And, then as, and then as we talked about you take it back to greek times and egyptian times and babylonian times and they all that their lives as as we understand according to those planetary alignments and systems and and energies and you know we've kind of shut ourselves off to that as a possibility we we're stopping curious about it i know I we need to know. <laughs> oh, it's like we just stop looking at the you know and just his explanation about like you know how it all works like like just the way that he was explaining about how these things have an effect and why and it was just it was like you were transported there 
mm-hmm. the 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 cogs of of the universal mind or the god force or life force in the big picture and yeah. it was just and then and then we spoke about beckham <laughs> well that's what i was say we went from that big picture <laughs> but also that it all starts with self. And so we all have, have our map, our predetermined, this is who we are in this, as written in the stars, as written in the planets. And our own free choice and will and what we decide to do with it is still ours to make. But there is something about it being written in the stars. As they say, that expression, you know, exists for a reason. And so it might not always manifest in the way that we imagine. And that's the fun of the journey, Right. But there is something innately us that is determined by by astrology. Love that. It's amazing. And it's it's like it's like the astrology gives you your life force ingredient. Yeah. <laughs> you've got to make this ingredient this. What are you gonna make with this set of ingredients? <laughs> That is so cool, isn't it? And and we just never know where where this life force conversation is going to take us next. So this was a brilliant example. It took us to the planets and beyond. It's a universal conversation. Planets via David Beckham. <laughs> I like David Beckham, Karela. I like David Beckham. <laughs> In his Neptune ways, I have more light for him now. I know he's got that Neptune quality. <laughs> <laughs> maybe we ask david to come on next you know maybe we know. ask him Let's we that out to the universe. <laughs> maybe we'll have david and david there you go there you go <laughs> on that bombshell as somebody else has used as a catchphrase until next time karila maybe maybe that's that's be be we hope this conversation has topped up your life force energy if it has and please help us spread the life force like share subscribe all of that <laughs> and may the life force be with all of us